Greg, uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for having here, um, giving me the opportunity to talk about the panels as well as my passion in terms of drug development. I am specifically in two panels, and the first one is speaking about uh, the complexities as well as trends in gene therapy, drug development. And the second one I think is incredibly timely as well too, is how do you make effective portfolio management optimization decisions when you are looking at a portfolio from that's specific, that's specific to gene therapy? Thank you for that question. That's one of the most exciting aspects of how the industry has evolved from a gene therapy perspective. And, and I just want to put a little bit of context. First, medicines came out, they were solid or dose, they were chemical entities. Then you moved to stair injectables. And then the industry over the last decade or, or the two decades moved to, to biologics. And this decade of ours is certainly emphasizing the need to deliver drugs with different modalities. And certainly gene therapy is the era that I believe we are pursuing from an industry perspective. But it's important to define what gene therapy means. And I think the first aspect is most people think about gene therapy as a viral um, therapy that allows you to express a gene that incorporates into your body and allows you to get sustained expression. And that is a wonderful mode of delivery for especially rare disease and patients that have gene replacement needs or, you know, or need to be able to have high expression of a certain protein that they perhaps were lacking. As we moved towards um, the industry evolution, we're learning that there are some challenges associated with viral gene therapy. And we've moved to, I think, based on the pandemic, a huge um, welcoming of mRNA. And that's obvious from the vaccine perspective. And certainly from that continuum, you can imagine a benefit associated not only with mRNA, but I was called nucleic acid delivery. And specifically for our company, we focus on DNA delivery. I think it's an incredible way to be able to deliver protein. Your body acts as their own manufacturer of this drug and could be quite a beneficial um, opportunity for patients because you asked the word access. And I think viral DNA or viral gene therapy can be challenging. It's, it's targeted for rare diseases, right? And, and clearly from mRNA and DNA perspective, we've been able to show as an industry that you can really provide this type of medicine for tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people. I don't want to say challenges because I actually think that if a if a drug works and it's safe for a patient, you can overcome any hurdles that you would have to face because what you're doing at the at the end of the day is making a patient feel better. So when but you know it, some of it may not be applicable to um, certain disease areas, and so when I think about viral gene therapy, it is difficult to manufacture. It has some potential of safety concerns, but just imagine the rare disease disease or, or the tens of thousands of patients that actually need that specific target. And it is a very viable operational as well as commercial model to pursue and certainly a huge benefit for patients. When you think about mRNA and DNA from a manufacturing perspective, they are tend to be a bit more simple than the viral, viral gene therapy manufacturing processes. I would say that mRNA tends to be a little less stable. And so you have challenges from a shelf life as well as um, uh, storage. You know, you've heard a, a lot about the cold chain and the minus 80 during the COVID times. Um, DNA, because it is um, double-stranded, it tends to be stable, so it has a longer shelf life, a bit more efficient from a manufacturing perspective, and so it's amenable to 
um, I think a, a, a therapy for the masses to some extent. I will say that we are actually trying to change the paradigm when you think about gene therapy or uh, I'd like to say nucleic acid delivery. The concept here, what we're trying to do is say, can we develop a medicine that can target tens of millions of patients? And so the first question you ask yourself is, is it safe? Can you build a plasmid, which is specifically our product, that delivers a protein, the protein that we're talking about is interleukin-10, and can you deliver it safely so patients can tolerate the, the medication because it is going to be targeted for you know, a large indication like chronic inflammation. And if you answer yes, that's the first battle that you take. It's a very important battle. And then you move to say, okay, is it efficacious? And one of the unique aspects about our product is that we've been able to show that um, our mechanism of action is targeting the resolution of inflammation. And with that resolution, you alleviate symptoms. So specifically, we're in a phase 2B program that's near conclusion, that is looking at pain benefits associated with osteoarthritis of the knee. And what we've been able to find that is two simple injections of our DNA plasmin allows patients to get clinically meaningful benefit associated with pain as well as function um, for the duration of a year. And Greg, I think I've shared with you and you can see the excitement in my eyes that this is one of these areas that I think can be so transformational because we're not talking about a transient benefit. I mean, people that are suffering from osteoarthritis, it doesn't come and go. They, they, they live with it for years before they're ultimately forced to take, um, forced to go to knee surgery. Um, and what we're showing is from an ease of clinical administration of two, two, twice a year, you can get this long lasting benefit. But I think most importantly, the benefit is associated with the resolution of inflammation. And I think that that is just a fundamentally different way of thinking about how you treat patients with these types of chronic inflammatory diseases. Um, interleukin 10 is an upstream modulator of inflammation and your body lives in, in a healthy state of homeostasis. So you have um, pro-inflammatory cytokines that are modulated and mitigated by anti-inflammatory mediators. And in a normal healthy situation, you, you are triggered by some immune activation, whether you get hurt or you know, your body's imbalanced and your pro-inflammatory cytokines go up. That's when you start feeling the inflammation. And in a normal world, you want to know your body's not right. So then you can self-correct yourself to some extent. Take rest your knees. Don't like continue to injure your, your arms or your legs. And what happens in, in um, chronic inflammatory diseases is that balance is not recalibrated. And so the, the anti-inflammatory mediators are not able to counteract the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Interleukin-10 is one of those modulators that helps you downregulate pro-inflammatory cytokines to reset your body back to homeostasis, which then ultimately drives the resolution of inflammation. And when that's not in check, it's when you get all of these diseases we talk about from a chronic inflammatory perspective. What we love about interleukin-10 is an upstream modulator. So when you think of NGFs, TGFs, all of these, all of these downstream targets that, that a lot of drug companies are looking at to resolve inflammation, they work, interleukin-10 works on top. So it's hitting multiple downstream pathways that drive inflammation. And I think that that's one of the novelties associated with our product as well too. It's not hitting one pathway, it's hitting multiple pathways. So let me start with some, some numbers. 30 million patients suffer from osteoarthritis in the US, that's 30 million. So we started the conversation, either, either we suffer from it or we certainly know many people suffer from, you know, being able to do normal healthy things like getting up, running, or 
walking or playing golf or in all of these other aspects or going to work. And what they usually have happen is, you know, at first they get mild symptoms, they take a couple of Advils, a few NSAIDs, and they say, okay, I got better. Um, as the disease progresses, the NSAIDs, these orals don't work. And then they start moving to COX-2 inhibitors, steroids. Ultimately, they fail on that. And then you move to knee injections. So of the 30 million patients, there's at least five to seven million patients that actually get knee, um, get knee injections. And when that fails, they move to a total knee replacement. And you can imagine how crippling that is for the patient, but also a, a big burden to our society from a productivity perspective. The medications that are available to them do work. They just work for a month and they can't have continuous injections um, from a side effects perspective, as well as a convenience perspective as from a patient level. And we're looking at, by the time you get to third line therapy, about 64 to 80% of the patients fail the current medications that are available. To them. And so for us to be able to find and provide another option to patients, that may potentially provide relief for a full year with two simple injections and hopefully prolong the need for a knee replacement is certainly the area that we're trying to build from a product perspective. I do, and I think it's so important to have options like I said, I think there's so many diseases that drug developers like myself have to rise up to the challenge. And in particular for large indications like chronic inflammatory diseases, and I'm talking about neuropathic pain, osteoarthritis, I'm talking about also neurodegenerative diseases like ALS and MS and you know dermatology, you name it. There are a lot of the disease areas anchor on the heart of inflammatory challenges in your body. And when you look at the fact that these patients will likely suffer not for six months, but for years, um, you want to provide a medicine that is highly safe, doesn't have any, any hints or possibilities of post-genome integration. You want them to be able to have a medicine that's redosable because again, you're looking at chronic diseases, right, at this set point, and non-viral enables those two specific characteristics. I think the other added benefit of a DNA platform is the affordability in manufacturing. The great thing about Zulu is we've got an abundance of opportunity and certainly because Interim 10 plays a role in so many other disease areas and we've got some promising preclinical work, we are progressing clinically with our osteoarthritis program. We will target a phase three in the, in the new year. We are also ongoing in facet joint syndrome for our IL-10 and I'm most excited about this is that we've got extremely promising results for um, ALS, which as you know, is a devastating disease with no um, treatment options available for patients. The data is so promising that we are in a mad rush to be able to try to get this in clinics and start our first phase, phase, phase 2A um, in the US in 2023 as well too. From there, we take all these learnings from our DNA delivery platform, and we think it's really uh, suitable for what we call these cytokine-mediated um, drug delivery potential. And so we are now also in the process of library generation of a number of other protein targets that we think that are quite amenable for our DNA delivery platform. And then last but not least, we also want to start looking at our next generation DNA delivery platform that allows us to do tissue, tissue targeting 
Um, so then you can look at other ways of modes of delivery. Currently, we have data on interarticular and intrathecal. Ultimately, we'd like to be able to get to some type of tissue targeting from a systemic perspective.